Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The League of Next Gentlemen, men from the past talking about games of the future. And we're a little bit sorry that this week's episode has been late. Daniel Dawkins, my colleague, has been off looking for his uh, Irish setter, Mr Scroffs on Dartmoor. That's set recording back a little bit, but we're here and ready to discuss all things to do with the next Xbox, plus a couple of next generation games that are coming your way, and that's all on the way in a couple of seconds. So Dan's been praying to his dark six Lynn god and uh, his dreams have come true. Microsoft has finally given us a bit of information about its uh, next console. Dan, tell us all about it. Eureka! It's confirmed for May the 21st. That's the day they're going to reveal the... Well, and this is interesting. They didn't say the next generation of Xbox, but a new generation of Xbox. I wonder if that's them deliberately distancing themselves from the next generation console war. Why would they do that? To be different. Do you think it's going to be different? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, actually it is. As in, you know, Major Nelson, who's the big community guy at Xbox, tweeted that um, he'd like to, like, they're going to roll back a new generation of games, TV and entertainment. And I think it's significant that, you know, they're adding those two other strands outside of games to say this is what we're all about. And this ties up exactly with the rumours we've heard to this point of Microsoft, you know, not just being a games company. This is off topic, but I can't stand that Major Nelson cove. I don't like the way he goes on the internet and throws out codes for freebies to people like a, like a sort of Edwardian king throwing bones from his table to the... Just tossing out to the proletariat to the various downloadable codes. But so the vibe with the next Xbox, well, two questions. Is it just going to be called Xbox? That's one rumour. Do you think that the 720 stuff's a, a nonsense? Yeah, I think 720 is probably a code word that may or may not have existed at some stage, but it seems to be, and the people we know inside our building who know about Xbox, they seem to think it's going to be called just Xbox. Um, and in fact, the only other probably competing rumour is Xbox Infinity, which sounds like uh, quite a mouthful, like, sort of slightly absurd, so I wouldn't Infinity have thought Infinity sounds so. a bit fruity to me. I mean, 720 seems to be just that people have doubled 360. Yeah. Is that double? My maths is terrible. What 720 came from is it became like the the internet's SEO term, and as a result, people were like, and God forced. forbid anyone should exploit those. <laughs> band. I know you you you're slave to 720 because it's the most popular thing. You have to keep threshing away at it. We've created this monster. But there was a lot of there was a lot of talk around PS4 that they wouldn't call it PS4 because the number four was unlucky in Japan. Yeah. And, I mean that always seemed like a border dash. They went to stay on the old Occam's razor, they've done it the straightforward way. I, I think Xbox, they will just call it Xbox or some incredibly neat but do you remember when subtitle. iPad called the new iPad just the new mm. iPad? That, I thought that was ridiculous as well. I think it's what they're going to do. I, cause I, think I suppose you do go into the shop and say, I want the new one. Yeah, I'd like the new Xbox, please. Well, as would luck would have it, sir, here it is. So we should offer some, uh, <laughs> we should attempt to offer some more insight. In terms of the specs and stuff, are you, are you expecting the widely leaked kind of, the widely trailed rumours to be true? And can you fill us in on a bit about yeah, what those will be? There's been lots of different leaks and counter leaks. Um, the latest like set of specs that people seem to be sort of vaguely in, uh, agreeing on is that uh, the hardware is going to be a 1.6 gigahertz AMD CPU arranged in two sets of quad cores, which, as we all know, is a really powerful chipset too. The, when you say they're arranged, I imagine two two sets of huskies lashed to a mm, lashed <laughs> and tethered and whipped <laughs> yeah. into high speed clock yeah. life. Um, you know, I I don't. And, you know, hey, I don't really know what that means, but apparently we, we've talked previously on this show about the blogger. I think is it Chris Thorot, Mr. Thorot, mm. who Paul uh, Thorot, yeah, yeah, Paul Thorot, not Chris. I know I've got that. That's his brother. <laughs> yeah, who hates video games. Yeah, he hates games. Um, he he came out this week and said uh, that some of the rumours about um, the always-on functionality locking you out of your mm. own games w were in fact a bit wider of the mark, and that any kind of always-on component wasn't going to be quite that onerous. Do you think Microsoft has spent, because there, there was talk they were going to announce earlier, but do you think they've been spending this time desperately trying to unpick the always-on side yeah, of things? Yeah, that's really interesting, and it's something we touched on in last week's episode, where you know, we, when originally they talked about revealing at the end of April, that seemed to be the preeminent rumour, but uh, now it's gone back to May, and a lot of people have speculated because you know the internet seems to hate always-on. Ironically, the always-on internet hates always-on. <laughs> And, uh, I can't stand this thing I'm using <laughs> yeah. to, to opine about this thing that I <laughs> don't like. How dare you apply this thing again that almost everything relies on? And uh, they, they've gone with, you know, I think probably they're, uh, like you say, unpicking the nature of always on this. Mm -hmm. now, whether they're like reducing the thing so that now you can play a box game without having to necessarily connect, or, you know, they're probably just peering it back or rephrasing the way they pitch it. Now, when we saw the big Sony reveal, I think we, as men of the next generation, mm. were quite pleased, but then less, less, uh, 
less savvy people than, than us perhaps were disappointed by what they saw. Yeah. What do you think Microsoft needs to do? What do they need to deliver to avoid that sort of reception? How do they win the announcement battle? The announcement battle is probably different to the actual battle of winning because the, the internet seems to have a very specific set of criteria of things it wants usually and I think... Is one of those criteria the moon on a stick? The moon on a stick, like some sort that's, of thing that tick one. literally isn't impossible. It's like more powerful than the top end PC and it's a hundred quid. But cheap quid. but also cheaper. Yeah, and a hundred quid. So a hundred dollars. I mean but that's not going to happen and I think Microsoft are going to position around entertainment and you know one of the big core components of their reveal will be XTV and what they're doing around entertainment and pictures. Now this ties into the hardware specs where from the very start Microsoft has been tipped to have 8 gigabyte of memory but 8 gigabyte of like slow memory compared to Sony's fast memory and that's like DDR3 memories I've got it here but the idea was that they're going to partition three gigs of that at all times to run systems and operations so that all the time your Xbox is on... So these are background on, apps that you're, you're using, your mm. Netflix and your Pizza Hut and your, yeah, your like social media. When you've stuff. got PS3 on you know, and you've got your XMB and you have to like duck out to it, it will live on top. In, in the new Xbox land, and you'll be able to go out and order all so the So a lot more want. services that will be instantly on tap while you're in a game or mm. watching a film is what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. And it will extend to full-on television recording and possibly even, you know, a lot of people have rumoured a socket in the back of the Xbox where you can literally put, your, for example, your Sky TV. So, you know, your Skybox will sort of be your Xbox. Is and that what the young knives of today want, do you think? Is that is that a killer feature? I don't know. It, it, to me, it sounds like it could be a killer feature done right. I mean, if you think about it in the scope of Connect 2 coming with it all, we are again approaching that horrific minority report future of, and we talked about this last week, the idea of you watch TV, and if you look away, the television you know, stops playing, which I'm not sure if I'm actually... I, I genuinely want that. can't understand the practical, the practical implications of that, because if there's two people watching it, who does it follow? But anyway, um, one of the other interesting things I wondered... What Sony didn't do is show the box and they didn't talk mm. about price. Do you think those are two things that Microsoft could then exploit because they've kind of been left open? There was, I think, some suggestion that there might be two, two pricing strategies mm. with the new Xbox. If I recall correctly, that you'll be able to buy one kind of straight up for $500, but there'll be another version that was $300, but that would lock you into buying $10 a yeah. month's worth of Xbox yeah. Live for two years. Kind of like being on a phone contract, or very much like being on a phone contract. Do you think that sounds likely? I think that's incredibly likely, and I think it ties in with exactly the entertainment aims, where you may get like an entertainment package which bundles in, let's say, some TV packaging, some music on demand, some video on demand. Maybe, you know, they are, they're going to look at cloud gaming as well in the same way Sony are at some stage. I just think they're going to deal with it in-house because they've got that size of resource. Um, so I think certainly that's part of it. Um, What's we also going to talk about? I've completely forgotten to. Let's move on. So the most exciting next generation announcement this week, for me anyway, has been uh, Shinji Mikami, the guy who invented back in the day Resident Evil's new game, which is being made for Bethesda. It's a horror game again. It uh, was originally called Zwei, I think, or Project Zwei mm. was the uh, code name for it, but has now been revealed to be uh, a game called The Evil Within. Uh, it's as the name suggests, a frightening thing. Um, a new horror game from Mikami, Dan. Uh, it's going to be on PS3 and 360, but it's also going to be on all next-gen systems. Yeah, which is really exciting. And, you know, and again, Mikami, certainly at one stage, was the guy who'd never made a bad game. And he's the man who like remade Resident Evil 4 something like five or six times until it was actually good enough to, to pass. And, and you forget what an epochal game Resident Evil 4 was, you know, hey, ten years ago. Now... The, you know, the thing is now, as we approach the next gen, you know, can his sort of development philosophy match what people are expecting of modern sort of standards? I mean, are you expecting a radically different approach to gameplay? Well, it was tough to judge from the initial footage they put out, which was a live action trailer, which I, I mean, I got, I, because I'm such a Mikami fanboy, I was mm. excited about it. And I got upbraided on the internet by a, by a chap who said I was getting too excited about live action. Fair enough, I guess. But... Uh, the thought of Mikami doing horror and on next gen to me is very exciting. Reading uh, reading the kind of the previews that have been floating around uh, on CVG and other sites, mm. um, it sounds like there's a lot of the kind of Resident Evil Four flavour in there in terms of uh, the mechanics. You play as uh, you play a detective called Sebastian. 
Um, he's being at one point pursued by a butcher type character with a chainsaw which again immediately reminds reminds you of Mr Sackhead uh, in, in Resi 4 there are sections set in an asylum and in a hospital which which kind of to me recalled Silent Hill yeah definitely and you kind of think that not really since the glory days of Silent Hill before that team got dismantled Silent Hill 2 certainly and then maybe 3 when there really was a they really were delivering proper shocks. And I think since then, it's only really, I guess, arguably the games like Manhunt and Condemned, both of which have come out of the West. Yeah. Um, but the horror genre has been quite kind of underexploited when you consider how popular they are as, as, as films. We've had, uh, like, certainly Silent Hill, like, almost in fall to itself, and, like, a series of developers, often Western developers, of taking on Silent Hill, and they all feel, like, slavishly bound to say how much they love Silent Hill 2. But as a result, what we're getting is, like, parodies of what's made Silent Hill 2 genuinely shocking and exciting at the time. And it just needs someone to, to like, produce genuinely chilling, subversive imagery. And I think, like you yeah. said, uh, like, you talk about Pyramid Head, the bad guy in Silent Hill 2. Is it really... And look, those creepy nurses, the fleshy nurses, really disturbing. Like, you disturbing know. or exciting? <laughs> and exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Reminded me when I was yeah. in the trio mm-hmm. centre after the Crimean cool. War. Crikey. Cool. It's a little bit hot under the beard there. Um, but, yeah, for those who are bipedal, fleshing, awful, uh, that's disgusting. Um, so, but it looks like, again, they're getting the art style right and that, that feel of, like, you know... The fleshy sort of six-armed main there's monster. The six, yeah, in the live-action trailer, there's that six-armed sort of witchy-looking female creature. Mm. Uh, which there's there is a there are screenshots now available online as well. And I think yeah. it'll be interesting again. I think to see with cross-generation development what what the next-gen versions of these games actually deliver. Whether it is just uh, slightly more resolution and some more kind of direct X mm. effects turned on in terms of the sort of lighting and particles and stuff, or, or, or whether there is any sort of attempt to to really leverage the power of the new platforms, which we'll come on to a little bit later when we talk about Assassin's Creed 4. Um, but yeah, I mean, from the sounds of it, over-the-shoulder type actions, shuffling mm. sort of zombies as enemies. The other thing that I thought was interesting is this being a Bethesda game, they're using the id Tech 5 engine, uh, yes. which was last seen uh, running Rage. Uh, Rage, which was an attempt at kind of a slightly horror-themed game, but, mm. but was slightly unloved because uh, it could take the textures several days to pop in, unfortunately. But otherwise, was was incredible at getting that kind of. They used mega texture to deliver that sort of real super detail on, yeah. on kind of big open world right. areas. So it'd be interesting to see if that that kind of tech is used in a similar way on the Evil Within. Rage, Rage had textures literally the size of the gardens in one of my second manor houses. It was absolutely astonishingly huge. And like I think again, they were hampered incredibly by the the memory limitations of PS3. Mm. And like on PS4, you've got eight gig of super memory they're going to be some big textures. So one publisher which takes a very enthusiastic approach to each new wave of consoles in terms of bringing their biggest games and also new IP along is uh, Ubisoft. And uh, this week, Yanis Mallet, who's chief executive of Ubisoft Montreal, Mm. has been talking to CVG about their approach to the the forthcoming generation of consoles. Um, He had some interesting things to say, Dan. One of the things that really stood out for me is that the relief, the sense of relief you get from a lot of these developers and publishers now that they're all able to work on really high-end PCs rather than having to deal with the esoteric architecture, especially of, of PS3. Mm. Uh, and Yanis gave an example where he said that when they were developing, uh, I think it was perhaps on the original Assassin's Creed, one of the coders actually took himself off and learnt Japanese yeah. just so that he could understand the uh, the programming documentation that went with PS3 because he knew that otherwise he couldn't squeeze uh, enough power out of it. Montreal are currently working on a, a couple of games. Big one, of course, being Assassin's Creed 4, mm. Black Flag, mm. uh, which is going to be cross-generation. Also new IP in terms of, uh, of Watch Dogs. Yeah. What, what do you make of their approach and, and the kind of the quality you think they're going to be able to deliver? Well, I think you know what characterised the PS2 to PS3 transition was a lot of developers who clearly weren't prepared, um, and a lot of them fell by the wayside. And I think... Ubisoft have, have been very good at adapting to changing times, and I guess what they've done is that you know they gambled on PC tech being the basis of the next generation, which is exactly what they said. And it seems like you know they they made the right bet. Now whether they were tipped off or they just thought it was sensible, um, and as a result, it meant that you know games we've seen already, like Assassin's Creed Three, that they were describing as next gen, but on current gen. You know, and that's obviously marketing shtick. You know, but to to an extent, the correct is in the technology they're using is going to bridge across to the next gen. And all these big publishers, we talked on a previous episode about the uh, Konami's use of the Fox engine, and EA have uh, the Glacier, not the Glacier engine, the Frostbite yeah. engine. Yeah. Uh, Square, I think, do use the Glacier engine. They all have their own in- in-house technology that enables them to straddle the two generations in that way. 
Um, but one of the things that came out, there was a, there was a separate Ubisoft uh, interview by a huge, huge, <laughs> by Hugh Rogue. He calls himself huge. He sounds like a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was talking about how uh, the big decision is going to be for how long uh, they do do this cross-generational support where mm. clearly they've built these tool sets, these engines that make it easier for them mm. to, to, to develop on both PS3 and PS4 and Xbox Infinity and uh, old Xbox 360 at the same time. Yeah. But for how long will that persist? Do you think that's going to be something that lasts for a year, two years, perhaps even longer? I think exactly what you say is I think that there'll be like a two, two-ish year bump period of them scuffing games across both and broadly the next gen version will be you know bring in the smoke machine unleash the laser you know it will be all these sort of dazzling effects beyond that i think we're going to see true integration of like really hardcore next gen features we'll see like games designed and built for you know people who've got a comfortable feel for what and that's been the way for all time right like you know games really take a leap on a year or two in and you know hopefully we'll see a few more technology leaders early on i thought what was really interesting from ubisoft's approach is that um they, they, in a very early stage of planning in all their games, they get someone involved from marketing and or like the business side and they, they build their games almost like marketing end up but with creative people involved and given that there's always an ongoing dialogue about oh, you know, games are being ruined by the attempt to be more populist, it's certainly that something that Assassin's Creed straddles the divide between, between being like a mainstream hardcore proposition and I saw even today like David Jaff was, uh, as he's tend to do, railing about uh, you know people making their games too overtly popular this it, is mr god of war yeah and he was arguing about too many people try to popularize their games i guess you could sort of finger things like well, let's say the army of two series or dead space um and say it's failed for them but i think he was saying like you should never try to do it but i'd argue that you know ubisoft are proving it can work done in the right way i would argue he's full of the brown stuff mm. i mean i went to an interesting uh, lecture uh, last year, mm. which was called "Why Does Why Do Good Games Fail?" which was in, it was interesting specifically because of how they they nailed this down. And one of these one of the examples they gave was uh, was Assassin's Creed, and they said one of the reasons Assassins had done so well was because the central premise was so easy to understand. And the central premise you can describe in a single sentence is be a time traveling assassin in the Holy Land, mm. the first one, or, or, or whenever for the subsequent ones. And that's an exciting thing to imagine yourself doing. A game they gave as an example of the opposite was something like Blur, the Activision uh, mm. car racing game, where the, the sellers drive real cars, but they've also got neon laser weapons and they're in races, and it's hard to really explain why. And that doesn't become like a, a, an attractive no. idea. But returning to Assassin's Creed, um, I think what will be interesting is how much of that new stuff does get leveraged. And Mr. Recor, huge, huge Recor. He calls, himself, he calls himself huge. I think that's pretty clear at this stage. God bless all who sail in him. Uh, he says, We are discovering these opportunities for Assassin's Creed in general, so we know games are becoming more social, more connected, and we know that the next generation is going to help us. That sounds like to me they're going to be leveraging the social sharey button on PS4 yeah. in some fashion. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I can't really say much more apart from the fact that the next gen for everyone is going to be all about share put on Twitter, put on our special network, you know, this is going to be so much of this. I mean, you know, maybe to the point where we'll be like, turn it off. Look, Make look, mother, I've made a video of me stabbing a man in the eye with my finger blade. Yeah. And, and again, especially if games are like as linear as they are at times now, if it's really, watch this thing that I did that everyone else did, that's not going to be very funny. Well, we'll talk, I think, a bit more about the, the next generation of controllers next week and what they can do, plus more, more next Xbox. So don't forget to subscribe and the League of Next Gentlemen will see you next week.